got the memo. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Oh, okay. So, welcome everyone to our first hybrid meeting. <laughs> uh, this is um, uh, has been uh, an exciting uh, um, technology uh, treat <laughs> to try and get <laughs> together. And uh, thank you to John Stansbury for the use of his wonderful 1930s home. It's uh, it's really fun to to see what uh, what that looks like, and uh, to meet and thank you to the people who are speaking today, and uh, to the people who sent in things for uh, us to listen to. I'm I'm going to read their words as they uh, um, since they couldn't be here. Um, caregivers are a very important part of our any recovery and we want to honor them at in whatever form they take and their caregivers take. Um, today, we'll hear about five different approaches to heart patient caregiving. Um, we'll, we'll start with, uh, I, I may do Andrea's if uh, Karen and um, um, Steve aren't, aren't here. Andrea Bear's brief story as a mother with a young child, Karen and Steve Gullion's story, um, Adele Levin's story that she emailed to me to read, Patty and Carter Dunlop's story, and maybe if there's time, the Kelly and Laura story. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> this chapter meeting is second in a series of advocacy. Um, meetings. January's was on how to be a healthcare advocate for, for everyone, you know, in the state, the federal level, and introduced us to Mended Heart's federal advocacy lead, Scott Leeser. Caregivers are advocates for their patients, and um, which is this meeting about caregivers, and March's meeting will be about how patients can advocate for themselves with clinicians. Um, and in fact, I wanted to see if I could actually advance the PowerPoint. Good. Okay, this is us. This Great. is that. This is that screenshot that uh, we uh, Scott Leeser took to um, give an example of people on the West Coast learning about becoming healthcare advocates in Menden Hart's Nationals uh, weekly Facebook chat. If you'll notice, he took all of our names off so that uh, you, you couldn't uh, follow, us, uh, follow us anywhere, but I thought that was really cool. Um, I'll go ahead with Andrea's, um, unless Karen and Steve are on. Are they, Bill, are they there yet? No. Okay. Oh, okay. Introduce the new people. Um, Neil and Anne are new um, people with us. Neil, do you want to say anything to say hi? Sure. Um, let me guess at what might be useful. Um, I'm 63. I've lived in the US for 30 of my 63 years. Was living in Europe most of the rest of that time. I was actually in London dealing with my mom's affairs who passed in June. Mm -hmm. uh, and I ended that visit and work with a cardiac arrest. Um, wow. Which resulted in um, two stents uh, being uh, in introduced into my body. Uh, <laughs> first time I think that anybody's actually opened up my body to do anything in it. Pretty much. <laughs> and, um, Let's see, um, my, my U, I'm, so I have a UK team, which is fading away, and I have a US team that's fading in. So my US cardiologist at Kaiser, as I was leaving the room, I said, what about a support group? Is anything like AA in the US? <laughs> now that you mention it, Mended Hearts 188, and I was distracted by the 188. But um, it felt like seconds after that happened, I got home and Laura was calling me. So. I might have done something to reach out. Uh, so yeah, here I am, I live just outside Montclair Village, and I'm looking to 
um, yeah, be supported, be of, uh, be of support. And also, as some of you know, I'm looks like I'm heading towards being one of the technologists in the family. So, oh, oh, welcome! <laughs> That's great. <laughs> what, what, Neil? What what kind of technology are you are you thinking about? Uh, what kind of technology right. do you? <laughs> Uh, I think uh, Bill and a few other people, I, I spoke to Bill and I spoke to Steve M. And so I think the wheels are turning and you'll hear more about that at your board meeting. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> wow, that's very exciting. Anne, can you introduce yourself to us? Oh, we can't, we can't hear you. Sorry, um, yeah. I'm Anne Olson. I live in Richmond up by El Sobrante. And uh, I had a TAVR put in on January 19th. Wow. And um, I met Susan, I guess, at the hospital on the Friday after that. That's how I heard about Mended Hearts and got on the list. So um, <laughs> great. This is my first meeting. All right. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Very exciting, and and uh, we have someone else who just had a TAVR as well. So this is very exciting. Yeah, we have one other new person, Dan, who has just come on. Oh, okay, Dan. Yes, I can't see tell? myself, but I guess I'm out there somewhere with you guys. I only see, well, we'll see people, I guess. <laughs> I got to expand my screen. That's a problem. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, what do you need? Well, um, introduce yourself since you're new. We haven't seen you yeah. before. And how you found us. Yes, uh, my name is Dan. Uh, I found you just on the, uh, the internet looking for support groups and came across Mended Heart. Uh, looked at all their chapters, which are fair considering the type of disease and everything, how common heart disease is. So I just picked Oakland and here I am. So um that's how i found it uh what else did you ask i'm sorry and you live where palmdale california which is sister city lancaster yeah that's about 45 minutes north of santa Cruz. yeah in in la county so you in went LA guys for, the, for, for coming the longest distance to the meeting right <laughs> <laughs> thank god for technology yeah. wow <laughs> okay well, welcome all. And I see that uh, Lorraine, you made it. Okay. Yeah. And Sherry is there. Yep. How about Steve and Karen? No? Steve, Steve told me he was going to be coming, but you know, Steve. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Well, uh, let, me, let me continue then with Andrea's story. Um, so uh, Andrea Bear is the former exec executive. Oh, sorry. Yeah, here I go. Executive director of Mended Hearts. She says that helping patients understand their role in the healthcare team is one of her main causes to support. She starts by telling us about herself and her family life. Her son which is on the next screen. That's her family. Mm. Her son was born in 2009 with a congenital heart defect and Down syndrome. He had open heart surgery at 11 weeks. He's had six surgeries and multiple hospital stays in his short life. He was my third child. So I thought I was pretty good at this mom thing and had no idea when I would, what I was about to face. Navigating his care was very daunting and scary, especially in the beginning. And this healthcare decision-making was really a foreign concept to me. I had no idea what I was doing really. And I was alone. Even though I was surrounded by family and friends, I just felt so alone. I felt like I was at the mercy of the doctors because I didn't really understand the medical care conversations that were happening. So I felt like I had to blindly trust the doctors. I felt out of place asking questions because really I was raised to think that doctors knew best. And so I was just there to listen to the doctors and do what they said. What I've learned 
is a saying by Oprah Winfrey, you get in life what you have the courage to ask for. So that was a, a watch a watch phrase to me for from her. I also grew up with no medical um, history and nothing. So I was, uh, at least I was not treating them as um, the next to God, unquestionable. It was more like a plumber. Why are you doing that? So let me, um, if Karen and Steve are still not here. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Just okay. Um, Am I next? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yes. Let me let me change the screen so you can actually see Patty instead oh, of. I don't know that you need to do that. Well, it's, <laughs> you'll be in a in a slightly larger box. How's that? All right. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Um, hi everybody. Can you hear me? I guess you can. Yeah. Um, yes. So I thank you for inviting me, Laura, to be here. I I. Uh, quickly put down a few notes, so pardon my reading of my comments. Um, I did want to just start by saying um, I haven't really ever thought of myself as a caregiver, so I'm going to change the titling and say that I'm a, a daughter and a mother and a wife, and so here is my story of those three <laughs> roles. So I spent many years, some of you may know, in the pharmaceutical industry selling cardiac medications. And this was during the time when balloon angioplasties were all the rage mm -hmm. and um, cardiac ablations were just emerging as a treatment for arrhythmias. So I had the opportunity to watch these procedures in person and once stand next to a surgeon during, um, while he performed a cardiac bypass at Seton Medical Center. And while that would never happen today, and I'm not really sure why the surgeon allowed me in the operating room <laughs> to watch him then, um, I recall telling my father later that same day that I would pay that doctor a million dollars for what he did because I was so amazed at the work that he did on this person's heart. It wasn't until I observed firsthand that I really had an appreciation of the heart and what cardiac surgery really entails. Ironically, within a week of that experience, my father had an unplanned bypass surgery at Summit Hospital. I was on vacation and called home that same day. His was a classic case of a blocked left anterior descending and a blocked circumflex artery. His recovery required massive changes in lifestyle. This was something I was excited to do with him. After all, cardiac health was what I talked about all day long in pharmaceutical sales. He even started taking one of the drugs that I sold, which at the time was called Cardizem. It's now Deltiazem, used generically for, for most part. It's not no longer branded, I think. Um, I enjoy that extra period with my dad, making turkey lasagna, trying new red wines instead of drinking scotch. <laughs> <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> and, listening, and listening to his stories of his new friends at cardiac rehab on Telegraph Avenue, which is no longer there. It's been relocated to Ashby. While my mom was less enthusiastic about the dietary and lifestyle changes and really didn't adjust to any of them, this heart hiccup brought my dad and I a lot closer. My son, Trevor, learned of a congenital heart defect, and he's still today. Um, as he was being yeah. prepped for an appendectomy. Oh. The anesthesiologist oh. said, Trevor, you didn't tell me you had a heart murmur. To which mm -hmm. I replied, Trevor doesn't have a heart murmur. And the anesthesiologist said, yes, he does. And he needs to see a cardiologist as soon as possible. That appendectomy may have saved Trevor's life. As it turns out, Trevor had a bicuspid valve instead of a tricuspid valve causing his heart to work a little bit harder to get that valve to squeeze sufficiently. And by his early 20s, Trevor's valve deformity was audible to the anesthesiologist. Oh. Trevor had an aortic valve and arch replaced at Stanford on November 30th, 2020, at the peak of COVID. I recall listening to the recording of Trevor's meeting with the surgeon as I was not at the consultation and taking copious notes and looking up terms. I will tell you now that that was one of the lowest points in my life. To watch your child walk into Stanford Hospital at 6 a.m. 
in the dark with nothing but his eyeglasses and his driver's license in his pocket is heartbreaking. He walked into that experience alone. I felt utterly hopeless and despondent. However, Trevor's recovery was outstanding with the help of his darling wife, Anna, and has been uneventful. He will be on medication for the rest of his life, but he has made a full recovery. And for that, we are all very grateful. And Trevor's here to do it. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and then the other guy in my life, Carter, <laughs> who also had a congenital defect of his mitral valve, which announced itself with symptoms of fibrillation and dizziness in April of 2017. He was instructed by his cardiologist to walk across the street to the emergency room and call his wife. (laughs) (laughs) Once there, I was frustrated to learn that the drug I had sold for years was administered at a subpar dose. So I asked the cardiologist to give another bolus and sure enough, Carter's heart rate went down immediately. Surgery to repair the valve was done shortly thereafter in order to have a 30-day recovery before our daughter's wedding on July 7th. Carter is a stubborn man, and I think this stems from his stubborn heart, as his post-surgery AFib went on for days. A cocktail Mm. of drugs didn't do the trick. Cardioversion didn't work. Amniodarone, which stops the heart, didn't work. And by the seventh day, we were exhausted, and I insisted that an ablation be done, even though that was not in the normal protocol so early after cardiac surgery. The ablation worked and Carter was discharged the next day. I'm almost done. Sorry if I'm fine. No, no, this is riveting. (laughs) Are you kidding? (laughs) Over the next four years, Carter has had two ablations and a few episodes of atrial fibrillation that were treated with high doses of beta blocker metropolol. Most recently, Carter also went to Stanford for open heart valve repair, which included a higher risk than his first surgery. This was a hard time for me as we were delicately told that it would be a good idea to update that trust that we've been needing to do for years and so on. <laughs> One fact we learned afterwards was that the surgeon had installed five cords made of Gore-Tex. So Carter is proud to say that part of him is waterproof. <laughs> <laughs> Every for Carter has been swift and uneventful. He goes to cardiac rehab mostly as planned and I, we walk all the time together at the lake, our townies as we call them, and I enjoy our time together. For all three men, I look at caring for them as an honor, but also as something that is just done. It is strange to think that the three men I have clo- I am closest to have all had cardiac surgery. Yeah, it's my story. Wow, <laughs> that was great. <laughs> great. And so wonderful that you knew things to suggest. How did you, that from your job, you knew how to do that? It was the same drug that she had sold. So she knew the protocol of what was to be administered. Mm -hmm. The first administration was not protocol. And she raised it to the nurse. And the nurse said, well, the doctor's in surgery. I can't change it until he came out. And he changed it. And the ablation, wasn't that a, that was a pretty uh, nervy call to to do. They didn't have any other options. Okay other than to have him continue to, to be um, hospitalized with a heart rate, you know, exceeding hundred beats per minute, oh. which is really hard after <laughs> surgery. I mean, the heart yeah, needs to rest. It was, a med- it was sort of a medical standoff. The surgeon, as everybody knows, is met- measured on how quickly you're discharged. So I was, well, no, yeah, there are oh, metrics go into all that. The insurance company, the hospital, everybody, you know, so the, the company, <clears throat> three, you know, prescribers or whatever, medical doctors, mm-hmm. surgeon wants you out. So he's he's like, you know, do what we're do, done. Do anything you can do to get this guy out. And and the and the electrophysiologist um, was resistant because, mm-hmm. as Patty said, the protocol to do an EP after a surgery mm-hmm. is is to let the heart calm down. Wow. And so, um, anyway, in the end, um, the electrophysiologist said it's safe enough. And, Sure enough, it worked. Well, we have a question, Anne. You said, uh, could you s- state your question? So, sure. Um, I just wondered. I'm I'm new to all this, and so you talked about an ablation. What's an ablation? Um, an ablation. Well, Patty, Patty was there at the beginning. An ablation is probably one of the biggest uh, medical intervention in cardiology that's come along. Uh, ever. Uh, so uh, a, a tremendous number of, of things with the heart are 
are, you know, you hear about AFib and uh, flutter and all the things that are, are essentially a heart not you know, being in sinus, which is the normal condition. And uh, what they knew, but they couldn't do anything about for years was that those are mostly electrical uh, impulse problems. So whatever happens to the, the aging of the heart, um, the, 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 the inside the heart is, is, is a, a zillion different, uh, whatever they're called, not electrodes, but pathways, pathways, sorry, she should be telling this, um, <laughs> reasons, reasons that maybe cardiologists understand, I don't, they get, they get somehow, um, mangled and that starts the, the different parts of the heart to be out of, rhythm. out of rhythm. And that's, that can be devastating. It can be lead to, you know, cardiac arrest. And so what ablation is, is they literally go in uh, minimally invasive through your femoral artery in your leg, up through your chamber, your heart, into the heart. And they literally, the best way that the uh, epidemiologist, uh, excuse me, the electrophysiologist described it, if most of us are old enough here, that in the old days when you had glass fuses in a fuse box and you didn't know what, what controlled what, you would unscrew it and see what lights went off. <laughs> Well, the EP is essentially almost the same way. They're not exactly sure what pathway is causing the irregularity. So they, they go in and they excite it with a little bit of electrical charge to see if they can recreate it. And if they find that that's it, then they literally zap it with more, more electrical charge to essentially kill it. And we have so many pathways in our heart that doesn't hurt you, but that, that, that stops the irregularity. Okay, thank you. Close caption. Do you know how to do that? No. Hold on. I I think we we can do closed caption. Oh, is that something? Somebody is, in the chat, I think, asked for a closed caption. Yeah, Bill, is that a a thing that is added? I didn't add it. No. Okay. So if I I don't believe that's a feature of Zoom. No. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So it we're I'm I'm yeah. clicking on more and it's not yeah, showing up. So bummer. Oh, okay. No. Okay. okay. There's no. So we'll just try and so, make it speak a little more loudly. Yeah, we can speak more loudly. Sorry, and... if I, I didn't speak up. So anyway, that is that is the ablation. It's really, it's uh, it's really uh, revolutionized cardiac cardiac care. Uh, many many uh, procedures that could that needed to be dealt with usually by pharmaceuticals. Can now be it's it's basically an electrical problem. As you solve the electrical problem, then you don't have to you don't have to administer drugs. Thank you. Um, I see that that Steve is here. Steve, does that mean that that Karen is here too? <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to turn on your your speakers, Steve. Yeah, she's in the other room. I just uh, let her know to. Uh, well, oh, hang on, okay. hang on. I'll be, um, I'll be right back. And Neil's got it nicely done. Thank you. Neil, Neil, it says. Um, I was just okay. asking if Bill makes me co-host, I can work on the closed captioning. Ah. But I need more superpowers than the ones that I have now. Okay. <laughs> Is that something he could do right now? Yeah. It's just a, a button to click, right? It's just a button. Yeah. Can you remind me, Neil, where the the co-host button is i think if you hover your mouse over my name the more button will drop down and for you give you an option to make me co -host. Yeah, yeah i got you i got you i think that will surface more controls for me yeah you got it now you thank you neil <laughs> yeah let me look around now Our team. <laughs> all right well um is this um may has a question yeah okay Oh, I just wanted to say that, you know, I think I've had one or two ablations, but they didn't work. And so mm -hmm. I've been on medication, you know, to control the atrial fib since that time. And I'm doing okay. So, you know, if it doesn't work, you can depend on the medications. Well, just to comment on that, after post-op, as Patty said, you know, I did get uh, incremental, you know, flutters and what have you. And, and the conversation I had with my cardiologist was, that uh, was always well. We could just we could just medicate you, or we could try. And I, I fortunately, I was fortunate enough that the the EP was successful. But I was mm -hmm. always sort of given the choice of if we can fix it, it's fixed. If we can't, we medicate it. And I always took the 
you know, I mean, for those of you who haven't had an ablation, I'm not, I'm not a salesman for them. But, uh, <laughs> it's, basically, it's basically a day procedure. You check in, you have the procedure, depending on, on usually it's an overnight stay, not because of what they did to your heart, but because the, 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 the you know, what they did to your femoral artery, they want to make sure that it heals because so, mm -hmm. it's fairly huge, large, large huge, and, large, you know, artery. Incision, incision into a, in one of your main arteries. So it's, it's basically <laughs> a 24 hour procedure in hospital. Yeah. When I had my issues, there was no ablation. It was a long time ago. And they tried all kinds of things, but I'm still in atrial fib. Hmm. Wow. Do but you have one of those monitors installed in your shoulder? Oh, no, 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 no. no. Okay. I just, I, I'm on warfarin. No problem. No problem. <laughs> all right. Talk to you. Bye. Okay. Mm hmm Steve? Yes. Take is, it away. Take it away. Uh, Steve and Karen show. Tell us sure. your story. <laughs> well, we apologize for being late. Um, I had an appointment that ran long. Plus, I, I, my laptop is is dying, so it takes 20 minutes, 15 <laughs> to 20 minutes to boot up. So that's that's, <laughs> oh. a, that's a bad sign. So anyway, just a little bit of context. Uh, I see, I, Steve, I think you, you need to talk to the gentleman. That picture is Neil. Afterwards, he's a whiz. Whiz. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so, just a little bit of, of background, a little context. Some of you have heard this before, but I'll be brief. So, it was uh, Easter weekend, 2019. My son, who is a um, physician's uh, assistant, was visiting that weekend. And typically, weekends, you know, I was walk doing some walking. I had run to the airport. Blah blah blah. Anyway, Sunday afternoon, I think it was, uh, I was mentioning to him some of my symptoms. Yeah, I'm feeling this tightness. And so he says, um, you know, you really ought to go to the emergency room. Uh, so grateful that he was there because I probably would have not gone otherwise because, you know, it's just something you power through, right? So anyway, long story short, went, went to uh, the closest hospital, which was a Sutter Hospital. They took me in. They admitted me right away started all the stuff. Um, I think I got taken down to uh, Alta Bates the very next day via ambulance. And uh, so anyway, that started the, the, whole, the whole process. And I think, Karen, I'm certainly certain has a better memory about this, but I think I was in the hospital a, a week and a half to two weeks. Um, so two weeks, two, uh, two weeks, you said. So again, yeah, went and she'll tell her story about that period of time, probably just what her memories were. But I just remember uh, she spent a lot of time there, which I'm very grateful for. Plus, uh, when I got home, I just remember she did so much. She had to do everything for me. Just a couple of quick examples. Um, uh, she, every four hours, you got to take the, the, the meds. I mean, you know, daytime, nighttime. So she would get up middle of the night, set her, you know, set her alarm every four hours, copy my meds. And, you know, uh, interestingly, we had bought a new bed in this room and I didn't want to spend the extra $300 to make it, to get one of those lifts, you know, where you can, you know, you can lift it up, adjustable bed. I am so grateful that Karen persisted and that we bought that because it was so much easier to get in, in and out of bed with, you know, being up this as opposed to being flat on my back. Anyway, just my remembers is in one quick thing. I remember I was wearing these uh, compression socks, you know, those are not easy to put on and she, every every time i needed them she put them on it yeah that, that's kind of a struggle i mean it's hard and anyway she uh, those are just two quick remembrances but she did a ton of work uh i'll be forever grateful for that um so with that brief introduction and background I, we were just going to kind of tag team it and share some of our recollections and remembrances i'm sure i don't appreciate the extra work and burden that that it was during that time um uh, i'll just one other remembers I, evidently right when i came out of the e er she and family members were there and they were shocked the surgery oh right after the surgery they were shocked because i had so many tubes <laughs> coming up they they and i i 
I, I wish I would have had a picture of that, but they said, no, you do not want a picture that you don't want to see what you look like because <laughs> evidently it was a, a shocking experience to the extent that um, they're really questioning whether they should have been there when I came right out of surgery because, I mean, I looked like I was what? You were unconscious and you looked really in ill health. So It was critical. He was in critical condition. <laughs> So, Karen, why maybe you can share some of your experiences, and uh, you know, just um, don't sugarcoat how how hard it was because <laughs> I know it was yeah. hard and took a lot of time and effort. So, well, um, I just want to say that we're really grateful for our son that's a PA. Um, mostly, he kind of helped <laughs> us learn what the ER doctor was saying. Um, I wasn't familiar with stents and, you know, just all the language, the hard um, information that he was giving us. And I was really glad that he was there because he could verify that what we were hearing was what he saw in an x-ray or what he knew to be true from his training and he gave us confidence in the doctor that we had it in the ER. So I was really, really grateful for that. Um, he helped me, helped us both make decisions about um, um, the hospital and the decision about what kind of surgery we should have um, I, I was really grateful for his knowledge. Um, one other thing that he did for us was the heart surgeon um, that worked with us. He was able to go to some, it's probably, you can Google it. I, I'm not sure. I wasn't sure how to do it. But just look up um, information about this doctor, the surgeon. And so... Mm -hmm. His ability to do that gave us a lot of confidence in the surgeon. We knew that we had one of the best in the Bay Area. So this was a stranger to us. We didn't know anything about him. So I think that was one thing that I was really grateful for. Um, that was helpful to us. Um, like Steve said, luckily I wasn't working. So when he... When this all happened, I was able to go to the hospital. I was able to spend time with him. And then once he came home, I was able to drive him around and help with the medications, you know, picking up um, medications from the pharmacy. And I didn't have to sleep, you know, because of a job. I could just, you know, be up and help him with the nighttime medications um so that was really fortunate we were really really lucky to be in a situation <laughs> like that um i remember being in the hospital and as they were telling us um after his surgery what what um this was mostly the occupational therapist but um talking about our home is two story and our bedrooms upstairs so just talking through he would be able to go maybe not go up the stairs so where would we um where would he rest where would he recuperate um so i remember that that's a conversation that him and i had in the hospital and what he was most comfortable doing. Luckily for us, he felt like he could go up the stairs and he did pretty easily. Oh. Um, and then he just kind of stayed upstairs for a while um, in the adjustable bed and, um, you know, a couple days and then we started walking and um, that kind of stuff. So I, I know he had to walk right away. So anyway, those, those things were kind of, helpful to have those conversations before we got home. And you know, I was going to mention uh, somewhere during that two-week period, two period in the hospital, Bill Dean visited us. And I, mm -hmm. I 
cannot for the life of me re remember that, but Karen does. <laughs> I thought well, I was more memorable than that. <laughs> <laughs> I did not re re remember that. <laughs> but to me, that was a really comforting visit because I saw someone on the other side of the surgery and then mm -hmm. he was healthy and vibrant and able to do this work and walk around the hospital. And Steve would walk at the hospital. Like he just walked around the nurse's station one time before the surgery and they were alarmed they came in i guess the monitors were alarming them in uh, some situation they just said what have you been doing and he said well we just kind of walked around the nurse's station but i guess it was enough his heart was just not doing well at that point so it was good to see bill and see somebody on the other side of it well you're welcome <laughs> um, Relatedly. Karen, <laughs> yeah. Karen, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I I didn't realize that I mean if he was in critical care and he was at home, did they not send you a, a nurse to help with that? That's they a did. lot. The nurse came the nurse came um once a day, but then once they saw that we were doing well and i i kind of felt good about this like i i was helping him get better and he was getting better so that didn't continue real long they they just felt like he was um progressing and that he was being taken care of i remember they came and took vitals and they checked his wound and that kind of stuff. But yes, we did receive that at home care also. I also remember there was a ton of material, I think, received in the hospital and afterwards. And that I thought that was very helpful, you know, in the, the documents about what your exercises are supposed to be. I mean, it was really, in fact, I still have, but uh, it was really good information is what I remember that this is what you got to do every day, blah, blah, blah. Um, I just kind of became a student. I, you know, just read everything I could read and remember our daughter-in-law being so helpful once we got home. Um, I had never had that much medication. Like I was blown away. <laughs> and you take this at this time and this at this time. And, you know, so at first it it was a little scary to me because I just was worried about um, the right medication at the right time and not missing pain medication. And, you know, it was, it, I remember it being very, um, very hard. Um, but she had a brother that had a heart surgery. So um, right away we got this intricate pillbox and she we had this whiteboard and she mapped it out and um so I think um calling on other resources was really important to me too like reaching out to um friends and family people that had gone through this before um was kind of a an important step for me. I have uh, one question I, I want to ask Karen. I, I we, We've never really talked about this one, but um, I'm just curious, what you think was the, what was the emotional in, impact? I assume it was strenuous, right? It was challenging in terms of your, but I, I've, I've never asked you, how did you feel? Was it, I mean. Uh, it was, it was super scary. <laughs> And it was, I, I kind of forgot what time of day it was. So I would forget when to eat. I would forget. I, it, one day ran into the next and <laughs> I'm a farm girl. So going to Oakland to Delta, what was the hospital? Delta Center. Alta Bates. Alta Bates. Um, you know, you go into this parking garage, you talk to this unfriendly parking attendant, you pay for parking every day. I mean, it was intimidating. And 
driving to Oakland every day, we lived out in the East Bay. So to me, that was a big deal. And so those kinds of things, coming early in the morning, leaving late at night, you know, sometimes when he would have a problem and they'd have to do a procedure, it would be going home late at night. And I heard all these stories about Oakland. We're not from here. So, you know, just how dangerous it was. And that really was unnerving that I'd be walking through this parking lot in Oakland late at night. Um, so some of my friends um, that I have um, would drop off um, a bag and in this bag were rice crackers and peanut butter and a book and, you know, fruit and, you know, just kind of my survival kit at the hospital. But I was so grateful for that because I, I used it. I needed it. So I will remember that um, for a caregiver that has to spend time in the hospital. I'll, I'll want to give that to someone because it was really important. And yeah, because I, I couldn't remember what time it was. I was just thrown off kilter. Um, Thank you. <laughs> there were, I, I don't know if you want me to. I mean, I could go on forever. <laughs> you you have more time. <laughs> um, so, um, I really it, it, this this experience that we had um, with the pharmacy is burned into my brain. <laughs> so our nurse before we left the hospital um, had she called ahead to our pharmacy to ask them if they had these medications um, for, for us to pick up um, later that afternoon. And I don't know if she talked to a tech or who she talked to, but they assured us that this medication was at the pharmacy. So I brought Steve home. He was riding in the back with his pillow and you know we creeped our way home. Um, got him settled at home. My son stayed with him and I went to the pharmacy expecting just to get my bag of medicine and come home and put it away and organize it. And they did not have the medication that we needed. Oh gosh. And that scared me. A lot. <laughs> and I, I, I never, I don't cry very often, but I cried in the pharmacy. And just said, I've just brought my husband home after open heart surgery and explained this situation. And they were really good about getting the medication when they saw that this was, you know, someone that was, was ill and needed that medication. But they were, um, I've never been to that pharmacy again. I gave them good. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like I I don't want to go there anymore. Um, yep. So anyway, but that's when my daughter-in-law came into play. She came with me that day. Um, let's see. Just I, you know, like I said, I kind of became a student, and I like the nurse that came after we got home. Um, it really talked to us about the Mediterranean diet. And I remember, you know, we bought some cookbooks and I was really grateful for Amazon at the hospital because <laughs> there were some things that that we needed for when he came home. So we could talk about it in the comfort of the hospital room where it was quiet and order it. And then it would just be on our doorstep when we got home. So I I thought that was kind of a a wonderful thing. Um, luckily, our home is in a neighborhood that's very walkable. So when we went on walks, I would, of course, go with Steve because he was just recovering. And, you know, so I, I felt really lucky about that. I think there was a lot of things in place that I feel were 
um, blessings because you know, not everybody has that. Not everybody has a walkable neighborhood or, um, okay. I don't know. Anyway, I, and I also thought the occupational therapist was very, very good in preparing <laughs> us for a home. Um, apparently I'm, I'm really talented and gifted in putting on support homes, <laughs> which I had no idea. <laughs> Who but knew thought, that was a skill, right? Yeah. yeah, she complimented me. So I was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> but um, that was the yeah. big one. I, I came home and worried about that. Like I'd heard nightmare stories about how hard they were to get on. And <laughs> so that was a relief that, that she so taught me that. You know, one rec one recollection I have is that uh, this, the in-home support and care provided by whoever, there were multiple visitors, lots of great material. They were really good people. That was huge to me. And I, I would assume to Karen as well, simply because this was, un as probably most of you, right? This is uncharted territory. You're not sure what to expect. And you're going to be on your own after you get home. But I have to say that it was very good, very helpful, and certainly made the journey a lot smoother for us. So I, you know, I, I wouldn't know who to thank specifically for that, but I, we had a, a parade of people come through. It just worked out very, very well. We always felt, I always felt very well informed about what, what we needed to do to, you know, be on the road to recovery. And, and I remember sending thank you cards, like their last visit, I gave them a thank you card and at the hospital and um, there was um, the ICU nurse. There was the particular nurse that um, Steve craved popsicles when he first got out of surgery and started um, nibbling on things. So popsicles were really big to him. And there was this nurse in the ICU that, that just you know, really like Steve. Snuck and, me a few extra popsicles. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think just being nice to the staff and being um, nice to the people that were coming to care for him meant so much to us that they were nice. And so it was easy to be nice back, but that extra time to thank them. And, and I, I think it ends up, you know, coming back to you. And and I, that that's not why I did it, but I, because I felt very grateful, but I honestly just, you know, my gut said, give them a card. So that's, we kind of buttered them up. <laughs> they were so, so good to us. Wow. I am seeing a couple of themes that have run through some of this that um, uh, you may have missed the one uh, that um, uh, Andrea said about you get in life what you have the courage to ask for. So when you asked for help and got to, you know, whether it was your friend giving you, I don't know, rice cakes and peanut butter, but it, whatever <laughs> you wanted to have and ask about help, um, you were you were excellent <laughs> at knowing what to to uh, get from the doctor. <laughs> And uh, um, be sure and watch the, the video uh, to see what you missed, because it was really amazing. You know, um, uh, Laura, could I make one, one more comment? Um, sure. Not related to heart surgery specifically, but uh, with regard to caregivers, my, you know, uh, both uh, my parents, Karen's mom, are elderly, and we both have uh, siblings who are their primary caretakers. And uh, my mom and dad uh, live with my sister in Houston. And so periodically, uh, other siblings will like one month, someone will go and stay for a week, vice, you know, and so on and so forth. And I have to say, um, till I started going and spent, I don't know how long, a week or two with my mom and dad, I had no idea of what a caretaker actually does. And, and they, my mom and dad aren't in, don't have serious health concerns, but you know, they're uh, in their mid to late ages, but I have so much more profound respect for those who are caretakers, 
regardless of what your medical condition is. I mean, I, and I felt like I never really understood it until I was there taking the place of my sister for a week or two. I just um, had no idea what was involved physically, mentally, emotionally, whatever. So um, that was a real eye-opening experience. And I think it ties into, you know, the gratitude we all have for caregivers at various levels and at various times in our lives. And Again, it was eye-open experience and really, a really good uh, educational. And I have so much, so much more respect for those valiant people or those people who persevere and are, are do such a wonderful job of caring for many of us. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, a hand raised. Yeah. Is that? Um, yes, that's me. Um, okay. Getting back to the yeah, getting back to the pharmacy situation. I I don't know drug it was did they give an did they give an explanation of why it wasn't ready like was it shorted was it or did they just forgot or what happened there i think um no they did not they did they didn't have it in stock and that's why i questioned if she taught the nurse at the hospital talked to a pharmacist or if it was a tech um it and then they yeah they just kind of passed it off as no big deal and I think I you know I I'm not somebody that um demands a lot of people but in that situation I became very brave and just said this it, this is critical this is urgent and essential that mm -hmm. we have this medicine. Good and then, for you. Yeah. So I think you kind of sometimes have to do things that are out of character, at least mm -hmm. in my case, because I'm 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 not super assertive, but when yeah. it comes to my kids and my family, I can be. And and it <laughs> took, what did you they say know. was the reason? What did they say was the reason it was not filled? The, the I, actual they reason. Didn't, they didn't tell me the reason, but they fixed it within the hour. And I don't know if they went to a different pharmacy and got it mm -hmm. or what they did, but yes, it was fixed very quickly, but it was still... <laughs> For them to say they had it, and then when we went to go pick it up, um, was uh, it, to me, I, I don't know, I, I jumped to the conclusion that that was in a way deceptive, and I, I didn't need that at that point. I needed, I needed honesty, and I needed to know where I got, I could get that. Yeah. Yeah. I think and, I wanted Go to ahead. say that the the material that Bill left is what got me into mended heart. So I think whatever material Bill dropped off that day was very helpful to us. It wasn't just it seems like like there was a little packet of information too, if I'm remembering right. So yeah, yeah, that was very, very helpful. The notebook that we got at the hospital is was like our Bible. <laughs> it was a binder that they gave us and we read every word. We we oh. didn't mess around. It it felt really important. Well, and and uh, the the mended hearts one uh, is trying to be a, to be patient friendly language so that you can actually understand what is in that. And that's um, a lot of people have have said something about it. And and Bill, I think you. Um, you had a good response when we heard they they might be uh, discontinuing the um, the heart guide. Uh, could you talk about that a minute? Well, they've changed the heart guide since the actually since when you were a visitor. Um, they've uh, revamped it. Uh, the problem is with the heart guide is is that it's a it, it's a, currently about sixty pages long. And they're coming out with a new one. And then it's available if you go online to metadhearts.org, you can get the revised heart guide. <clears throat> but it's a hundred and I don't know, 
14, 120 pages long. They have no intention, from my understanding, of printing it again so we can distribute it to patients in the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the problem with that is I don't think most people want to go online and wade through 120 pages of mm -mm. information. No. Uh, now, granted, mm -hmm. you probably would zero in on the, the information that was if it was searchable, yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, I'm only if only if you're one of the visitors is it sort of incumbent upon us to all be somewhat familiar with all the content. But I don't think anybody else wants to read the 120 pages. Yeah. Dan, you have your hand up again. Yes. Uh, getting back to the pharmacy situation, um, did you did they ask? if you wanted to be you know get consulted for the particular drug or did you just or did they ask yeah i guess they did, did they ask. ask yes they did ask and i i was seeking any information i could find <laughs> so i would talk to i would talk to people that um especially a pharmacist somebody who had credentials that's what i was looking for is um I, yeah, I would, they're, they're the only ones that can do the consulting at tech can yeah so yes i i did listen and i um i took him up on his offer okay we have we have uh, one more to to uh um listen to uh so I, if you don't mind i want to i want to get this in this is from adele levin uh she, she and bob are are, are they both visitors or is it just Bob that's a just visitor? Bob. Just Bob. Just, okay. Um, they're members of our chapter and our hospital, and uh, Bob is the hospital visitor. They wrote a book about their experiences of working through Bob's heart condition together. And they gave a wonderful talk to our chapter uh, back in 2019. Um, Adele is still resting after a bout with COVID but sent me this uh, sketch of her learning experience of becoming a quote, proficient caretaker for me to read to you. She says, of course, I was at the hospital many hours each day and evening. Life moved from the tennis court, swimming pool, and my writing desk to Bob's room in the hospital, the corridors for walks, the cafeteria for food. For me, that was more like home. The nurses know a lot. The only thing I knew better was my husband. And I found them receptive on the whole when I told them something he needed that wasn't exactly the way they would do it. If you're respectful and clear, they will try to accommodate. Over the nine months of surgeries and hospitalizations, we were at three different hospitals. And in all that time, we only ran into one stinker. <laughs> who happily found us intolerable too and got off our shift. <laughs> and one Sunday, a newbie physical therapist who was seeing Bob on his first day out of various levels of intensive care and her first patient was totally and inappropriately overwhelmed by how weak and frail he was. She made it clear we we would not go home without weeks and weeks of rehabilitations, which temporarily discouraged us. Happily, she vanished. <laughs> not that there is something wrong with an interim in a rehab center. Sometimes it's necessary choice or fit circumstances that our doctor and Bob and I had other plans. When we did come home, everything was harder. I had to cook the meals as well as clean house, go to the grocery store. Friends are valuable assets or neighbors you feel close to. Every friend is usually comfortable doing good at one thing or another. Like um, one of our friends would do, um, bring us a piece of medical equipment she had from when her mother-in-law was ill or get pillows we needed to keep Bob comfortable. Another brought and practiced his musical instrument and meditated with Bob. Another watched sports with him or discussed books. Friends are great. Family members are good helpers too. 
They might even cook for you. Our families were supportive long distance by phone and email. It takes a city, but the feeling the caregiver give, gets as the patient regains strength is an amazing gift. Yeah. There, there are obstacles too, though. Calls to the cardiologist office when or if something happened. Taking to talking to the on-call person who you don't know, but it's all doable. Also, the hospital sets you up, like Karen said, with a nurse who comes once a week, once a week to make sure everything is proceeding well and making additional suggestions. We had some wonderful nurses who taught me how to cook beans and suggested fruit smoothies to help Bob regain some of his, the lost weight. Um, all these activities began in cardio rehab, a wonderful necessity in taking the first steps back to a more active life. The nurses there were wonderful and helpful too. The biggest problem Bob and I had was an issue that we had before the heart attack and centered on his daily shower. The issue was my fear of him falling, fainting, slipping on the water that got out of the shower, et cetera, and felt I needed to do or control the process. I wore raincoat and shower cap and <laughs> cool sandals. Bob liked my getup, but not the way I tried to do what he felt he could do himself. I confessed to the nurse who came every week to check up on us and found out that the hospital could send a helper who would teach me and Bob how to do it with ease and pleasure. Oh, if only, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> but a few days later, when the woman arrived, that's what she did. She listened to the problems we were having with the shower, getting in, getting out, and the control issue. And she let me watch her do the shower with Bob. She had a marvelous disposition, was from Jamaica, tall and strong, and sang with a beautiful voice. <laughs> Bob emerged from the shower glowing, full of pride with what he could do, relaxed <laughs> when there was something he needed help with. She came several more times before she graduated us. We both had learned successfully. So don't be afraid to ask for specialized help. It is, we found, worth asking for. Mm. Adele finishes her email by wishing all the best to the attendees and the patients they care for. <laughs> I, I want to add one little thing. Since very few people here have uh, met Adele and Bob, because uh, they never, for whatever reason, would never attend physical meetings, but he's been a very loyal hospital visitor for probably the last five or six years, however long he's been doing it. Uh, Bob stands about six foot four, five, and Adele stands about five foot two. So now you can imagine the difference <laughs> when they were with her oh. trying to help him in the shower when he <laughs> literally towering over her by over a foot. You know, type of thing. <laughs> well, and, and uh, again, that message, get what you ask for what you need yeah. and uh, work at getting it. I, I also want to, want to say one thing about um, Bob and Adele. I, they, after Bob, after they, excuse me, after they uh, published their book, <clears throat> they had um, a little get together at um, a coffee shop that they were, would always go to. And the way they wrote that book was, Bob would do a chapter, then she would do a chapter. Then Bob would do a chapter, and she would do a chapter. So, um, and that's how the book was paged, which was a really interesting way of reading a book, you know, and really very, very interesting when they were going through that reading the book for us. So, so I just wanted to add, I, I've never read a book it's that, a, it's a, it was a team <laughs> effort. It's a they they self published that book and mm -hmm. Bob has written several other books. He's a good writer. Uh, it's really worth it if anybody's interested. I'll be happy to contact Bob and give him your contact information. It's it's a 
it's a good reading. It really is. It's, and a lot of it, of course, is about uh, health and really about caregiving and everything else. So it, it fits very well into this topic today. Bill, what's, what are, the, what's the book called? I was just going to ask. I think. <laughs> okay. it's, it's called. I, I, uh, it's called uh, yeah, I, I've got I'll, it. It's I'll, a card. Cardiovascular romance. I will help keep you alive. Yeah, I will help you. I will help stay you stay alive. Mm. Yeah. Huh. There's an email in the chat right now. Oh, good. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, and Adele is um, has uh, said that she would be happy if anyone if anyone wants a copy. She's uh, she's got it, and it's also on Amazon. Oh, great. Oh, Anne, you have to go. I'm sorry. Yeah, she told us earlier, or told me earlier, that she was going to have to go. Okay. Well, the the last official person to talk is Kelly, <laughs> who's been hiding it off camera here. Um, I'll switch. Kelly can see here. Pardon me. So I'm Kelly, Laura's partner. Um, Hi, Kelly. Hi, Kelly. Uh, sounds like an AA meeting. <laughs> I'm a caregiver. Um, you know, caregivers fall into all different kinds of, of places. Some are uh, more hands-on, and that's what's needed with, with the patient. Others can be more hands-off. I was hands-on initially when she we got her home after her second ordeal, um, which started because we always planned to do things either in the yard or in the house on the hottest day of the year. So just to anybody out there, if you got something planned and it turns out to be the hottest day of the year, skip it and wait for a cooler day because something bad is always going to happen. So anyway, that said, um, she was in the, the critical care ward. She was one of the, um, at Kaiser, she was one of the few people who survived a cardiac arrest uh, and was resuscitated three times the emergency room wow. and survived uh, went back in and they reinserted her her stent which had become dislodged which caused the cardiac arrest um laura has been an interesting person to take care of she's very independent and doesn't like to be told what to do or when to do it, which is okay. That's that's fine because I'm independent and it, it works out. Uh, but she would come, my office happens to be in the bedroom. I work from home, uh, have been since 2008. And she would come into the office and she would lay down on the bed and start talking to me. And in the middle of a word would go back, go to sleep. And I would look over and see, you know, oh, okay, she's asleep. And I would continue working an hour or so later, she would wake up and finish the sentence. <laughs> By this time, I was already off doing something else. Um, so it was, it was, it uh, taught me that mental gymnastics go with caregiving because you have to be able to roll with the punches. Uh, I also believe that uh, uh, praising and applauding and thank yous to the medical staff that helped her survive was very important. Um, when she was in the critical care ward, it was uh, 
she was one of the few people that was going to go home. And that was not lost on me. Uh, I, every day that I would go in, I would go in and there would be a new empty bed that someone had occupied. And I found out later from the uh, ward nurse that they had had several deaths during the night. So it was not lost on me that that Laura was a mir uh, a walking miracle. Well, she would be a walking miracle when she got out of bed. Um, but we had people from all over the hospital, nurses, doctors that would come and visit because of her amazing journey through the the, uh, it the was, ordeal. It was a bit disconcerting. Nurses would bring in their friends and say, I want you to meet someone who's going to walk out of the ICU. And I was like, what else would you do? So I, I didn't know that this was um, really as serious as it, as it was. Yeah, it, it took the, the nurse from, uh, she was Eastern European, to actually come in and pointedly tell Laura, it's like, you know, you, you, <laughs> you don't get it. You get to leave. Most of these people here don't. And that's that's um, something that a lot of people with heart conditions and they go through the ICU and they do walk out of the hospital don't don't get is that so many don't get to leave. Um, so other than that, but getting home was one thing. Laura decided, uh, I guess after a week of being home, she wanted to go and get Starbucks cards for all of the ER people and the nurses. Thank she, yous. Thank, thank yous. yous. And she wanted, she was just gonna get up and go to Starbucks and buy them. And I'm like, no, you're not. Because you just had a cardiac arrest and you are in no condition to go. And she's like, oh yeah, I'll go. And she got out of bed and uh, went to do her thing to get ready. And I suddenly realized I don't know why it was so dense, that she was getting dressed. She was going to get in the car <laughs> and drive down to Starbucks. And I realized that that can't happen. So I jumped out of bed, threw some clothes on and ran and met her at the, the front door just as she was about to leave. And I made a deal with her. I said, you know, okay, you can drive and go and do whatever you want, but I have to be in the car with you. And she was like, well, okay. So I let her get in the car, let her get behind the steering wheel because Laura learns better by practice. <laughs> so she gets in the car and she goes to back out and she couldn't turn the steering wheel. Mm to straighten out and she was sitting there and she was like I can't turn it and I'm like yeah and she looked at me and she was like huh you knew this was going to happen and I'm like well it was likely but you know whatever <laughs> and she's like you know would you I asked politely would you like me to drive you to starbucks and she's like yes so we did the chinese fire must have been all that cpr stuff uh thing and uh we switched places and it was it was a couple of months before she could actually drive herself but it was a learning experience i think for both of us i i had older parents that i had been driving around um primarily because my mother had dementia and my father had a stiff neck so he couldn't turn and look so i had a little experience with that and helping care give my with my parents uh four kids one weekend a month we each went and took our took care of our parents and um everybody has a different experience Everybody approaches it differently. I'm not a medical doctor. 
but I have a sister who works at Stanford, so gratefully I could ask her questions and she could go and ask her friends, you know, uh, information. We also have uh, a friend that's a nurse and an RN, so we could always ask, ask her for help as far as that goes. But I, I know that uh, with Laura's not being able Growing up in a in an environment where there was no medical intervention, growing up when you got sick, you got sick. Excuse me. And I did not. Um, so it was very important for me to be at all of her doctor's appointments, so that I could be the one to hear what the doctor was saying and then ask questions and translate for Laura. Because she had no idea what any of this stuff was. And I, I happen to be one of those geeky, weird people that likes to research. So I would be on, on the web and WebMD and all these other places. It, they have great information. So it's, it's, it's a learning experience for everybody. I think it kind of tailors to the kind of people that are involved in the situation. <laughs> some people are more dependent and some people are more independent. And um, we made it. We're still here. We are. Great. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm watching them. It's just Steve G. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Eight. Eight. Yeah, you could put it along the side. Okay. So, um, I'm just checking the the chat to see if there's Steve Steve, Steve signing off. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Well, any other comments before we before we sign off? Well, I would just like to to thank you for the for everybody who participated. Um, that that was such good information and really moving to hear the stories of caregiving. I I didn't have a caregiver. Um, after my surgery and I haven't been a heart caregiver. So it was, it's, um, it, it's interesting to hear about. Very moving. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good yeah. All right. Well, here, this is uh, our first attempt um, at a, a hybrid meeting. Did it, uh, how did, how did it feel? Oh, thank you, Neil. <laughs> Dan, you have a question? Oh, we can't we can't hear Muted. you. Yes, I do. Yeah, yes, I do have a question. I was wondering if anybody has had experience and what their feedback would be on I think there's at least two meds, Cetalol and uh Dickerson, I believe, that require some kind of hospitalization. What what was their experience with that? With feedback, that kind of thing, and what what wrong? What did they say? What went wrong? What went right? That kind of stuff. Anybody there? I guess not. Okay. Yeah, Patty is telling us that she doesn't um, she doesn't know those drugs. Yeah. What are the names again? Yeah. What's the names again? Yeah. There's two. There's two. Whoops. There's two meds that require hospitalization for starting out on. Uh, one of those is beta pace or Cetalol, and the other one is Tikison. Um, and they want it, you know, X number, well, depending on who's there and who's doing it, they want you in the hospital to start you on it. You know, they hook up to typical EKG and that kind of stuff. I haven't done it yet, but um, they don't want you to go to another type of arrhythmia that you may or may not have. And I just wanted to get feedback from anybody that has done that and uh, how did it turn out, um, you know, that kind of thing. Dan, I would suggest, is, since nobody in this group is able to help you with that or anything, 
I would suggest that you reach out to Minute Hearts National. Uh, they have a question thing and they have their staff, they can probably point to to somebody or they can answer it themselves. Uh, so it says minutehearts.org. Okay. Yeah, and they actually have uh, uh, mendedhearts.org has a um, daily, uh, what is that? It, it's a, a place where you can ask questions and uh, people from all over the country can give you answers. Okay. So you, have, you just have to know that this is not doctor advice. This is just patient understandings. So office hours, Neil, on... on on the website i thought that's what you were uh the words that you didn't know that they offer office hours or ask me anything whatever oh. never mind <laughs> just remember that the national headquarters is based in georgia so if you're trying to get them you have to allow for the three hour time difference okay okay well i think this uh this does it. Oh, wait, are you, uh, Sherry, are you waving goodbye? I just want, or? no, I'm just telling you, just because you've asked me before. I have tried to contact Kaiser many, many times. Uh, Again, this week, I have no update as if we will ever, <laughs> when and the other <laughs> will be able to, to have a room for a meeting, but I have no updates. But I have okay. tried to, I've left many messages. I asked pleadingly if they could please give me an update so I would be able to tell you this morning, but I have no information. Yeah. But Thank I've you. been asking, possibly, yes, if we can meet at the Fabiola building. Yeah, it's it would be a lovely place. Um, I have, and I, I have hope, no confirmations. Is is that uh, who's who's our iPhone guest? And that's me. That's me. I oh, that's you. I've just oh, okay. been watching the, the chat. So. Oh, okay. Back and forth. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Did I say something? Yeah. Uh, you don't. They, yeah. Turn, or you can sit here. Okay. Yeah. Hi, this is John. Uh, Hi. Some of us Hi, were at my house. <clears throat> I particularly appreciate the social aspect of mended hearts and the and the face to face contact with people, and I hope you found this to be <clears throat> good for you. Uh -huh. And I would love to see more people come to, it won't be at my house all the time, but I just offered it because we couldn't find another place. And I want to especially thank the people that made this possible, which is uh, <clears throat> Laura and Kelly and, uh, and Trevor. Uh, helped us with the technology and uh, uh, made it possible. And I just want to let everybody, oh, the, I also want to thank May, May Ng. She brought some lovely snacks and uh, I think only a couple of us have eaten them, but she brought the snacks this morning. So I just thank you and uh, hope we can get together again sometime, at, face to face that is. Thank you, John, for, you. for letting us uh, invade your house. <laughs> yeah, I um, let's see, Carter. Any any last minute things? Uh, I have one humorous thing uh, in my our recent experience down in Stanford, um, which was a, somewhat elongated in terms of getting out. The second to last person that we saw was the uh, look. I'm a big fan of of rehabilitation. Uh, it really matters. Uh, but this woman who was in charge of rehabilitation came in with her shiny brochure and was fl fl flipping through it. And Patty was in the was in my hospital room at that point because she was coming back and forth. Uh, and and this woman was very proud of all her content. And at some point during the presentation, she said, so you're not planning to go back to work for 12 weeks, right? And I run my own business and <laughs> Patty kind of looked at me and I kind of looked at her and we're like, who's going to, who's going to break the bad news to her. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's lovely if you have that, that, that luxury. <laughs> Whoops. We had a crisis and that next Monday, all of a sudden I had a 
Zoom call from our kitchen. And all I could think about was this poor woman in rehab seeing me, you know, 36 hours after she'd been at my hospital on a, on a Zoom call. So anyway, <laughs> there's a lot of ways, there's a lot of ways to, yeah. to get back. <laughs> Did you know? Okay. Well, we'll sign off from this end and uh, thank you everyone for yeah. participating. And uh, thank you. Oh, oh, Steve's gone. Steve and Karen, that was wonderful. Patty, thank you. Pleasure. Kelly, we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Thank you to all the speak all the speakers. Thank you. Thank you.